Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, after what appears to be another assassination attempt on former President Trump, U.S. politicians are calling out for solutions. There's going to be reports and recommendations coming forward, and, and Congress will act swiftly. We need accountability. We must demand. But where is gun control in this conversation? and this election. I'm Natasha Del Toro, and this is The Take. The FBI and U.S. Secret Service are investigating an apparent assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump. The incident took place Sunday afternoon at his golf course in Florida. Officials say Secret Service agents spotted a rifle barrel poking out of the bushes as they were clearing holes on the course ahead of Trump, then fired on a gunman near the property line, only a few hundred yards from where the former president was playing. The suspect, 58-year-old Ryan Rout, has been charged with two federal gun crimes. Democrats and Republicans have been quick to blame each other's political rhetoric for the incident. But they both agree on one thing. There has been a demand, a bipartisan demand, for an emergency hearing to make sure that there is the necessary funding. And there's already a $3 billion allocation for resources. Now they're asking for even more to make sure that there is the manpower necessary to not only protect the current president of the United States, but the former presidents of the United States as well. Both agree that more security measures are needed But one thing remains conspicuously off the table, controlling guns. So far this year, the United States has seen over 385 mass shootings, with more than 15 million guns purchased annually. Drew McKevitt is the author of Gun Country, a look at America and its history with firearms. And he's also a history professor at Louisiana Tech University. Drew? Thank you so much for coming on The Take. Natasha, thanks so much for having me. Now, Drew, I know that you've been looking at the issue of gun control for a long time now. So I have to ask, what were you thinking when you heard about this latest incident, what appears to be a second assassination attempt on Donald Trump? Were you thinking about guns and gun control? Well, yeah, of course, naturally, given what I do, I was thinking about guns and gun control. But my first thought was, thank God, Uh, you know, thank God nobody was hurt. Thank God nobody was killed, both because I'm a human being who doesn't want to see anyone uh, injured or killed or become a victim of gun violence, regardless of what I think of their political positions. But also from a political perspective, thank God, because I think that would be a, a total catastrophe for the United States. Assassinations of of any major political figure would be a political and social catastrophe. But this one in particular, um, I think, would provoke the kind of political violence that Americans haven't seen since the 1960s, if not all the way back to the 1860s. And I worry that that this would embolden uh, white nationalists and similar groups on the right to unleash widespread violence against their perceived existential enemies, and to do so supported by many of the gun laws that have reshaped America in the last couple decades. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really incredible. It's unprecedented. Two assassination attempts in a very short period of time. And so right now, Republicans are asking for more security, more protection for Trump. We have U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson who's Republican like Trump, was speaking on Fox and Friends. President Trump needs the, the most coverage of anyone. He's the most attacked. He's the most threatened, uh, even, even probably more than when he was in the Oval Office. So we are demanding... At the same time, the U.S. still has a president who's a Democrat, Joe Biden. Do you expect either side of the aisle to recommend gun control after this latest incident? No, I don't. I don't expect any kind of action, uh, especially in the short term, because it's an election year and no candidate for the presidency or Senate or, or Congress wants to push any further on gun control or gun rights right now. For this election, it feels, uh, especially since Harris entered the race, that things have been swinging back a bit to uh, the right 
Think about the states that they're fighting for right now. We have Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia. These are states where Democrats believe they can pick up kind of disaffected Trump voters. And they're not going to pick up those voters without reassuring those voters that guns will not be an issue. And so I thought that brief exchange during the debate was fascinating, where Trump sort of leaned into the microphone and said, She has a plan to confiscate everybody's gun. And uh, the moderator sort of let it go, but but Kamala Harris actually intervened and said, I want to I want to clarify this business about taking everyone's guns away. Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. It's part of an interesting, broader uh, law and order vibes to this election. People are worried about crime, even if statistically there's no reason to be worried about crime. They're worried about immigration, even which they believe contributes to crime, even though we know statistically that that's not true either. But law and order politics is always kind of vibes based and standing behind the right of people to own firearms to protect themselves, I think is going to, to sell well in the context of, of that kind of politics. But this inaction on gun control wasn't always the case. More after the break. So, Drew, it sounds like right now you're not expecting a lot from the U.S. government when it comes to gun control. But what's interesting and why we wanted to talk to you today is it doesn't seem that that was always the case. What impact have assassinations and attempts had in the past on the gun control debate? Yeah, arguably you could claim that our gun control regime today was born out of assassinations and assassination attempts. Hmm. And that goes back to the the successful assassination attempt on John F. Kennedy in November of 1963. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting which is going to prompt in Congress the first serious gun control debate of the post-World War II United States. And it's going to take five years for that bill, eventually it comes to be called the, the Gun Control Act of 1968, it's going to take five years for that bill to get across the line. So not only is that bill prompted by the assassination of John F. Kennedy, but it's eventually in 1968 pushed across the line because of other assassinations. We have in April of 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King, and then in June of 1968, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. And for the most part, it is a mild law. It imposes a number of new requirements on gun dealers. It imposes a number of restrictions on who can buy guns from where and when. It stops the mail order trade of guns across state lines. This is what Lee Harvey Oswald had done. He had purchased a rifle through the mail. And then, of course, the other notable assassination attempt we have is in 1981 on Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was two months into his presidency when John Hinckley Jr. drew a $29 handgun outside the Washington Hilton Hotel on March 30, 1981. He wounded the president, Brady, a Secret Service agent, and a Washington police officer. And that, is too, is going to provoke a gun control movement. It's going to provoke an effort to do something about handguns, which for long have been seen as the real scourge of gun violence in the United States. Eventually, Congress is going to push the Brady Bill across the line, hmm. uh, which is born out of that tragedy of, of not just the Reagan shooting, but Reagan's press secretary being paralyzed. And of course, aside from these assassination attempts, other key moments that have shaped the political conversation around gun control are mass shootings. So which ones come to mind for you? Well, I think the three biggest that, that sort of shaped the world we live in today are, are Columbine in 1999, and then Sandy Hook in 2012, and Parkland in 2018. The total of 15 people are believed to have died here, 12 students, one faculty member, and the two Sandy. young killers. The Beth worst grade school shooting in U.S. history, at least 27 dead, 20 children, seven adults, including the principal, and the gunman killed himself. And all this morning, chilling images and 911 calls from the Parkland massacre, painting a timeline of terror. 
And it's not a coincidence that these are all uh, mass school shootings. These stick in the mind as much as anything else because of the particular vulnerability of these spaces. And the transformation of these spaces, just since I went to high school uh, 25 years ago, has been really dramatic. The students I have in class today, who, you know, typically they're 18 to 22 years old, they were all born in the aftermath of Columbine. They all grew up and they've all lived through a world that has been shaped by, in the language of security, the hardening of schools as spaces, hardening against potential threats like mass shooters. And so, Columbine, Sandy Hook, and Parkland, also key moments in the history of gun rights and gun ownership and gun control. You mentioned Parkland as one of these sort of pivotal moments. I think it's worth mentioning that this was the event that pushed Tim Waltz to change his stance on guns, right? Yeah, that's it's kind of remarkable. There was a great story about this when Walls was drafted into the campaign. He was for a long time one of the very few Democratic congressmen who still received support from the National Rifle Association. But in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, he talks about this exchange he had with his daughter, whose name is Hope, who implored him to do something. And this is the thing that turns him toward thinking more about what, what he would call sensible gun reform, right? He said, he still says, I'm a hunter. I like sports shooting. I like collecting guns. You can do all of those things responsibly and also support laws that will keep young people safe. So he made a pragmatic decision based on a horrific event. But what do you make of the fact then that these events that used to serve as catalysts for gun reform no longer seem to. I mean, what does that tell us? Yeah, there, it's, it's a hard kind of problem to diagnose. While we often talk about gun control, more quietly what's happened in the United States over the last 20, even all the way back to the 1980s, the last 40 years, is the expansion of gun rights, uh, winning out in many cases over gun control. And so many states, most states, in fact, have passed in the last 20, 30, 40 years laws that have expanded the right of an individual to carry a concealed weapon. So much of the movement in gun politics in the last several decades has been at the state level. So I would point to that. I would point to the, the dramatic expansion of that consumer market for guns. Americans, by and large, don't like to talk about restricting their consumer rights. And so when the number of guns has doubled in the last 25 years, from perhaps 200 million to now in excess of 400 million, talking about restrictions on that would be like talking about restrictions on cars or refrigerators or toasters, very common and, and widespread consumer goods. Also, increasingly, we see that in the aftermath of something horrific like Parkland or Sandy Hook, the polling tells us Americans are demanding more and more gun control. But slowly over time, and the gun rights people in the NRA, they know this, it reverts back to a kind of mean in which Americans are once again torn. And when you start talking about restricting access to that massive market, that's when Americans get a little more cagey. Yeah, Drew, I mean, there's just something here that's really difficult to get your brain around, because on one hand, most Americans do support gun control. Most Americans would like to see a ban on automatic rifles. Um, but then when it comes to actually passing more legislation for gun safety or gun control, you really see a big pushback. But do you think it might also be to a degree that we've become desensitized to these kinds of incidents? Yeah, I think there's no question about that. But I also think there's a kind of backlash against that. And I think that's generational. I see that among the young people I teach, even here. And, you know, I live in rural North Louisiana, which is as a conservative as it gets, as in most areas in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a, a gun culture in and of itself. Many of my students grew up with firearms. They grew up hunting. They grew up sports shooting. They're very comfortable with guns. And even here, there's a kind of sense that somebody has to do something that the older generations in particular have failed us. It's the same when you think about problems like climate change or the economy. It's once again, the older generations are handing us problems that their four parents did not pass down to them. And so I think the energy is going to come from the young people. 
And now we're looking at another election with Trump, who is very clearly a supporter, a gun supporter, and and supported by the pro-gun movement, and Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic candidate, who some might think would be stronger on gun control. Um, But what can we expect from the next four years when it comes to guns in America? Yeah, well, of course, that question hinges on who wins the election, right? So if Trump wins the election in terms of gun policy, we're not going to see anything new. I think he's going to pass off to the NRA the ability to write legislation or block any kind of legislation they might want to do. And so I don't think we could expect anything from a Trump administration in terms of gun policy. What you might expect from a Trump administration, ironically, is a slump in gun sales, because that's what happened in 2016. In the aftermath of Trump's election, gun sales declined quite markedly because every time we come up on a presidential election year, there's a big spike in gun sales because there's a lot of anxiety and insecurity about what a next administration might do. And then there's a lot of fear that if a Democrat gets elected, and this goes all the way back to Bill Clinton in 1992, that Democrat is going to push for new restrictions on access to the gun market. As for a Harris administration, it's hard to tell. I think for the most part, the status quo under Biden is probably what she would continue to do. She can only say so many times that she supports an assault weapons ban, but without a Senate and a House that also supports something like an assault weapons ban, it's unlikely to happen. I also worry that an assault weapons ban would very much be a a small band-aid on a giant wound uh, in the sense that We've got something like maybe 30 million of these kinds of weapons already out there in the United States. They would almost assuredly be grandfathered in in some kind of new law, and they would still be accessible to people who want to do terrible things. So uh, in the long term, I have a lot of hope, I think, for what younger generations might accomplish. And I think those organizations that chip away in terms of pushing greater background checks, even an assault weapons ban, they're doing great work. But I'm not sure we're going to see all that much movement over the next few years. And just just to push this a little bit more, what are your thoughts? I mean, that it would take the children who are the ones at risk, you know, going to school and having to potentially face these mass shootings to make change versus politicians who now, like Trump, who has been the victim of two now assassination attempts. <laughs> You know, it's a real it's a real kind of cowardice on the part of the political class right now. The historical echo I hear when I think of Trump now being a second assassination attempt and still, you know, we'll have no movement on gun control. We'll say nothing about gun control. It dates back to 1972 when George Wallace, the, the arch segregationist governor of Alabama, was running for president once again. He's shot, too on the campaign trail. In fact, he'll be paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. And in the aftermath of that, reporters asked him, do you support gun control now? And he said, no way, no way. So I don't know for this older political class what would ever bring about change for them. I think they're so kind of locked in their ways. And I think we need a new tack. I think a young generation might be able to provide that. And, you know, if we think about how the current gun world we live in was created over the course of 40 or 50 years dating back to the 1960s, it only makes sense to think that to change that it's going to take 40 or 50 years. It's going to take major generational change. It's going to take young people confronting major systems like consumer capitalism and the security state and the mass incarceration state. These are big, tremendous problems to confront. And it's going to take a long time and a lot of people to do it. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Tamara Kindacker, Amy Walters, Sonia Bagat, and Chloe K. Lee. With Hisham Abu Salah, Dua Masad, Hajar Saleh, Shraddha Joshi, Colvin Miltenberg, and me, Natasha Del Toro. In from Malika Bilal. It was edited by Noor Waz Waz. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexander Locke is the Take's executive producer, and Nate Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow.